is it bad judgment or good judgment to hit uh, Iranian sovereign territory in Damascus? No, that was a ma that's something the Israelis decided to do. Um, what about Iran's frustration at part of its sovereign territory being flattened? Well, I would argue there is a, a massive degree of difference between what Israel did in Damascus and, as I said, 301 weapons being launched by the state of Iran. What would Britain do if a hostile nation flattened one of our consulates? Well, we would take, uh, we, you know, we would take the very strong action. This is my video update on this Tuesday morning, April the 16th. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with Lord Cameron giving an interview to Sky News where Lord Cameron was trying to, to justify Israel's attack on the Iranian embassy in Syria. And then the Sky News reporter asked Lord Cameron the obvious question. What would Britain do if our embassy was flattened? And Cameron's response was, we would have to have to hit back at, at the country that attacked our embassy. Uh, 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 <laughs> man, man, did Cameron look really, really bad in that exchange. Good on the Sky News reporter for asking that question. Cameron really made a fool of himself during that interview. Anyway, Cameron, Cameron had a bad, a bad day, <laughs> didn't he? He really had a bad day because he, uh, he met with, uh, with Yolanda as well. Yolanda Navalny. That's right. And Yolanda Navalny met with David Cameron and she posted on Twitter X, I want to express my gratitude to the Foreign Secretary of the UK, David Cameron, for taking the time to meet with me and my team. Our discussion was extremely productive. It's reassuring to see that the British authorities recognize that Putin is not Russia. The true Russia stands against war and advocates for a change in leadership. Together with all Russians, regardless of where they are, we will continue to oppose the dictatorial and criminal regime. The Putin regime, which got 85 percent, 87 percent of the vote of the vote in the in the elections, the presidential elections. I don't think that signals that the Russian people want to change in leadership, as Yolanda puts it in this Twitter X post. The true Russia stands against war and advocates for a change in leadership. Really, Yolanda, is that what the Russian people are advocating for? A change in leadership? Really? With Yolanda as president? <laughs> Has Yolanda even been to, to Russia in like the past six months? I don't think so. But I don't know. I could be wrong about that. But uh, there, there you have Cameron. At the, uh, I imagine, he's meeting Yolanda at the, the foreign ministry in, uh, in London. And they're basically talking about regime change. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> do, do you see what's going on here? Cameron is taking a meeting with, uh, with Yolanda and they're discussing how to regime change the elected leader of the Russian Federation. <laughs> oh boy, Cameron, Cameron, Cameron. I think that, uh, that Cameron is making a bid for uh, Clown World of the Year awards at, uh, at the end of the year. Look out, Annalena and uh, Trudeau. There's a new, a new contender, a new player. <laughs> His name is Lord David Cameron. Oh boy. Bad day. A bad day for the foreign secretary. So let's, uh, let's talk about Alensky. Someone who, who's never won. He's never won a clown, a clown of the, of the year award, but he's always in like the top, top five or top three, but he has yet to win 
a Clown of the Year award. But uh, Lenski, he, uh, he is begging the collective West to treat Ukraine like Israel and for the collective West to shoot down missiles and drones, Russian missiles and drones, because he saw what the collective West did for, for Israel and that upset Alensky. That upset a lot of, a lot of Ukraine uh, leaders and uh, pro-Ukraine analysts. They saw everything that happened the other day with uh, the Iranian missile and drone strikes into Israel and they saw the 99, the 999 percent success rate in shooting down those missiles and drones. And uh, Ukraine is very upset. Why are you not treating us like you treat Israel? That's that's Zelensky's complaint. Well, Zelensky. You still haven't, you still haven't understood, have you? <laughs> you still haven't quite understood what's going on. McFly, <laughs> hello, McFly, <laughs> McFly. Let's have uh, Kirby explain this to you, Alensky. And Kirby, he was, he was asked by a reporter in his press conference the other day. I still don't know what exactly Kirby's job title is or what he does at the White House. I don't know, but I just call him Kirby. I call him Kirby. And he was giving a press conference the other day and he was asked about about the complaints coming from Ukraine that uh, the United States and the collective West, they're not helping Ukraine shoot down Russian drones and missiles. And Kirby said, and I quote, different conflicts, different airspace, different threat landscape. Kirby also recalled that President Joe Biden made it clear from the very beginning of the war in Ukraine that the U.S. did not intend to be involved in it in a combat role. We are not a part of this war. <laughs> that is what the United States and NATO and the Collective West have been saying for two plus years now. We are not a party to this war. But uh, look, this is the one time one of the few times, one of the rare occasions, where I actually uh, agree with Kirby. He's right. Different landscape. You know, Israel, small, Ukraine, huge. Uh, different airspace. Different, uh, different conflicts. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which way? Let's go this way. Kirby's right. And, and you know, the collective West... For the past two years, they've given everything they have to Ukraine. Everything they could give, and then some, they've given to Ukraine in terms of weapons, in terms of surveillance, in terms of everything. Money. They've given it all to Ukraine over the past two years. So to, so to compare everything that the Collective West has given to Ukraine with one day, one day, one, one event that happened in the Middle East is, you know, it's, it doesn't make any sense. This is, you can't compare the two. You cannot compare the two at all. And, uh, and also, with Russia, you're dealing with a country that has hundreds and thousands of missiles and weapons and hypersonic missiles that, uh, that the collective West, even if they wanted to, provide some sort of protection or umbrella like what they provided to Israel still would not be enough to handle all of the weapons that Russia has, all of the advanced weapons that Russia has for two years. We're not talking about one day. We're talking about two years now. So, you know, Alensky has gotten more than enough, <laughs> much more than enough. Uh, it's just that the Russians have have destroyed everything that the Collective West gave to Ukraine. They've destroyed everything that the Collective West has thrown at them. They've defeated the Collective West at every, at every turn. And uh, that's just the reality of the situation. And, and the, the fact is, Mr. Alensky, that, uh, that you're a proxy and 
Israel is an ally. And many analysts have made that point. Uh, Yeroman has made that point. Lord Bebo has made that point. Ukraine is a proxy. It seems like Alensky hasn't quite understood that. And the people around Alensky and, and the analysts and the media around Alensky that are complaining that, that the collective West is treating Israel differently than Ukraine. So uh, yeah, that was, that was Alensky complaining, complaining about the, the support for Israel that he saw, the military support that he saw for Israel with, with what's happening in, uh, in Ukraine over two years, two years of conflict in Ukraine. And for Alensky, it's still not enough. Countries have been demilitarized, like whole countries have no more tanks and no more, no more fighter jets. They've been demilitarized by this conflict and Alensky is still complaining that it's not enough. So things are terrible for Ukraine on the front, on the front lines. In uh, Chasov Yar, Russia is advancing. Ukraine is retreating. Russia is actually advancing very fast and Ukraine is retreating very fast. There are reports of mass surrenders. There are reports that some units, like the Azov guys, they're just refusing Sirsky outright. Sirsky's like, go to Chasov Yar, and some of the Azov units are like, uh, no, <laughs> no, we're not going to go, because they saw what happened in Bakhmut, they saw what happened in Avdivka, and they're like, no, <laughs> we're just not going to go because this, uh, this city, this town is lost. So we're not going to, to go into the, the grinder to be annihilated by the Russian military. And, uh, and yesterday, there, was, there were reports that Russia hit, hit um, a, a building, a structure. I'm not quite sure what what exactly this was, but uh, they hit an area where a lot of Ukraine military units were, were stationed in an area known as Chuguyev. And potentially a lot of high ranking Ukraine personnel was there. Some rumors were saying that even Budanov was there, but I, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. But uh, there was quite a panic on uh, Ukraine social media the other day with this Russian missile strike. From what I understand, they hit a lot of, a lot of Ukraine military personnel and very high ranking and important Ukraine military personnel. But um, I don't have any more details on that strike. So uh, Mike Johnson is going to come to the rescue. No need to worry Alensky and Project Ukraine because as I, have, I, as I have been saying for a while now, Mike Johnson is going to get money to Project Ukraine. And the latest reports are that Johnson is preparing separate funding packages to present to the House for a vote. One package is going to be on Israel. Another package is going to be on Project Ukraine. And another package is going to be on Taiwan. There you have it. The three, the three conflicts, right? Middle East, Russia, China. And he's going to present these separate funding packages to the House for a vote. And I imagine all three of these funding packages will be approved, though we don't have the exact details as to the amount of money and how everything's going to be structured. I imagine that the Ukraine bill is going to be structured, worded in, in such a way that it's presented as a loan. <laughs> a loan. <laughs> eh, give me loan, I pay back loan. Trust me, America, I pay back the money, don't worry. Uh, yeah, that it's going to be a loan. Uh, and Trump has signed off on this idea. As long as it's presented as a loan, 
Trump is not going to, to get in the way of this funding package. And I believe within the next week or two, this money is going to come up for a vote in the House. So, I mean, the money, at least with Project Ukraine, is going to be used to, uh, to fulfill contracts with the military industrial complex because they've, uh, they've had their, their weapons stockpiles depleted. So a lot of the money is going to go to the MIC. A lot of the money is also going to go to various entities that were promised a lot by the Biden administration. They were promised the riches of uh, a Russian regime change, and they didn't get that Russian regime change. And so they don't have the riches from that regime change. And so they, they got to get something out of all of this. So they're also going to get their cut, 10% uh, for the big guy, of course. And whatever is left is going to, to go to Ukraine, which I imagine is not going to be much. But, uh, you know, the, the, the money that's going to be given to Ukraine, the $61 billion is is just another indication that Project Ukraine is winding down. Everyone is, uh, is going to get their, their payday. You know, the project's coming to an end. So they're all going to, to sit at the table and they're all going to get their, their cut. And that'll be that. Maybe they can get to the 300 billion in frozen assets. Maybe they will not, who knows, but um, at least they're not going to, to come out of this empty handed, the MIC and, and various other oligarchs and, and campaign donors and other multinational neoliberal corporations, <laughs> they're all going to make sure that they get something out of this. So uh, this, this just means that we're one, we're one step closer to the, to the end of Project Ukraine when everyone is, is going to get their, their payday. So Reuters had a very interesting exclusive article that they posted yesterday with the title exclusive. Russia-Ukraine Black Sea shipping deal was almost reached last month, sources say. And the summary of this article via Reuters says Russia and Ukraine reached a deal with Turkey, sources say. But Ukraine pulled out at last moment, according to sources. Deal would have given safety to merchant shipping and Turkey's Erdogan was about to announce it on March 30th. What an interesting story from Reuters, huh? Which shows that, that, that there is some negotiation taking place between Russia and Ukraine. That's what this article shows. At the very last minute, Ukraine suddenly pulled out and the deal was scuttled, said one of the sources. Three other people confirmed the version of events. Russia, Ukraine, and Turkey declined to comment. It was not immediately clear why Ukraine pulled out. The people who spoke to Reuters said they did not know what had prompted Kiev's decision. The talks on the shipping deal, which have not been reported before, offer a glimpse of the quiet diplomacy going on behind closed doors on ways to bring the two warring sides to negotiation, if only at first about merchant shipping. The text of the deal, a copy of which Reuters has seen, said that Turkey, as part of its mediation efforts, had reached agreements with Ukraine and Russia on ensuring free and safe navigation of merchant vessels in the Black Sea in compliance with the Montreux Convention of the regime of the Straits. And this story was published April 15th, 2024. An exclusive by Reuters. Russia and Ukraine are negotiating. Yes, they may be negotiating in terms of uh, merchant shipping, but the point of the negotiations is the point of any negotiations are to start small and hopefully you can build up to, to something bigger and more substantive. So an incredible story from Reuters, but but what are they reporting? They are reporting that Ukraine pulled out of the deal last minute. 
and they have offered no explanation why they pulled out of the deal. So they had everything ready to go and Ukraine decided to pull out. Just like what happened with the deal in March 2022, the framework for a ceasefire in Ukraine and the Alensky regime pulled out of that one as well. This was not a ceasefire, this was just on, on the Black Sea and on allowing safe passage to merchant ships. But once again, you see Ukraine pulling out of this deal last minute, and they offered no explanation according to Reuters. If I had to guess why Ukraine pulled out of this deal, why Alensky pulled out, I would imagine that, uh, that the, the Biden White House they called Olensky and they said, no, go to this deal. You are not going to, to sign this deal. You're going to ditch this deal and you're going to continue to fight because as a proxy, as a proxy, that is your job. You're not an ally. You are a proxy. Get it, Olensky? McFly? McFly, you get it? <laughs> And, and you know, the, the, the Black Sea, if there was a deal in the Black Sea, right, and you allowed safe passage of merchant ships, well, for Ukraine, for the collective West, that would mean no naval drones, no Black Sea fleet being destroyed narrative. And that's the last thing they want because, you know, they've been milking that, that Russian Black Sea fleet destroyed narrative for six months now. So they don't want that narrative to, to go away with some, with some sort of deal in the Black Sea brokered by Turkey. And Turkey's going to see this. And what's Turkey going to say? These guys, these Ukraine guys, they're, they're jokers, man. That's what Turkey's going to say. We come up with deals. We broker deals. Another deal that we've brokered. We've brokered another deal now. And what's happened? They've pulled out of that deal. All right, so what happened yesterday in the parliament in Georgia? <laughs> wow, did you guys catch the video of that brawl that went down in the parliament in Georgia, in Tbilisi? <laughs> Man, over, over a bill that was approved, I believe, by the parliament on foreign agents, according to the document, NGOs and media that work in the interests of a foreign power will be required to register in a special register and report their income. That's what this fight was all about. And the person that sucker punched the, the other parliament member who was speaking, he was sucker punched by someone who is against this bill, which says that if you are a foreign NGO or media company, you have to state that you are a foreign NGO and media company and report your income. In other words, you have to show how much money you're getting from, from your sponsors and what that money is being used for. And this person that, that delivered the sucker punch, he's against this. He would like the, the, the money that's being dished out to NGOs and to media companies to remain secret, <laughs> right? He would like it to all be secret. We don't want to disclose the activity, the financial activity and the financial backing of, of NGOs and, uh, and media companies. And the funny thing is that you have protests now in, in Georgia. I've seen video of, of protesters. And of course they're waving the EU flags and, uh, and they're very upset with this foreign agents bill. But, um, the, the funny thing is, that uh, that this is no different than what the U.S. has with the FARA Act. If you are a foreign agent, you have to register. That's that's the FARA Act in the United States. But you see, it's good for the United States because in the instance of the FARA Act, they wanna they wanna see if if you're getting money from from Russia or China or or whatever, right? In this instance, what you're going to see with this uh, act, with this bill, 
is you are going to see that all the NGOs and all the media companies in Georgia are getting funded by Collective West, by the EU and the United States. And so the EU and the United States, they, they don't like this. <laughs> they don't like this at all. So they, they put people out on the streets and they gave them the EU flags and they're protesting. This goes against human rights. <laughs> it's no different than the FARA Act of the United States. But in, in this case, we're talking about the EU and the US in the FARA Act. We're talking about uh, Russia and China and Iran and whatever, whatever else. Right, so that's, that's the difference. That is the difference. This is going to expose a lot of EU and US meddling in the NGO and media and politics of Georgia. That's what this is going to expose. And the EU and the US, <laughs> the collective West, they don't want this stuff to be exposed, right? And it's gonna probably show that, that Russia really isn't meddling in Georgia. That's another thing that they don't want exposed. They don't want the financial statements of the NGOs to show that they've been getting a boatload of money from, from the European Union, while at the same time, NGOs are, are getting very little money from Russia. It's going to destroy their, their narrative of, of Russia's always meddling. But what it's going to show is that actually it's the EU and, uh, and the US and the collective West that is meddling in Georgia. So yeah, the minute you see protests in your country and they're, and they're carrying EU flags, they're waving EU flags, yeah, you know that something really bad is is going down. <laughs> that's, that's the sign. Whenever they're waving EU flags, that's when you know that, that something bad is, is playing out. <laughs> oh boy. You see those EU flags? They should make you very nervous. Whenever you see people waving an EU flag, just, just run away. Go in the opposite direction, <laughs> right? Oh boy. So let's do some more news and we'll wrap this yeah, we got to wrap this video up. So Pirate Schultz, he is in China. I talked about this yesterday. Arg, I'm in China. <laughs> Arg, matey. I want to meet with Xi Jinping, matey. <laughs> Pirate Schultz. Anyway, the reports are from the Wall Street Journal that Germany is going to push China to, to drop its support of Russia. <laughs> and Pirate Schultz is just the man to convince Xi Jinping to ditch Russia. <laughs> Arr, don't worry, I'll go to China, Arr, and, I, and I'll make Xi Jinping walk the plank if I have to. <laughs> oh boy. Reuters is reporting that, uh, that Russia is restoring its oil refining capacity, which was knocked out by Ukraine drones, and Reuters is shocked. They're absolutely shocked at how quickly Russia has restored the, the oil refineries that were hit by the drones. I discussed this about a week ago, that, that the Russians, the news was that the Russians are fixing up whatever damage was being done to the oil refineries within a matter of weeks. This was no big deal for, for Russia. And now Reuters is reporting reporting this, this news and, and they're scratching their heads. They're like, God, how? How did Russia fix everything so quickly? I just don't get it. I just don't get it. <laughs> it's all the shovels. It's all the shovels. They're able to, to fix up stuff very quickly because they have a lot of shovels, Reuters, that's why. And then, of course, the big story yesterday in the United States is that uh, the Donald Trump, what is it, the hush, hush money trial, whatever this, this thing is being called, that thing is starting. And uh, Trump... Trump is pissed off, man, and he should be pissed off. <laughs> he has a right to be pissed off because my understanding of this trial is that it's just absolute bollocks. Absolute bollocks. They're going to do whatever they have to do to make sure that, that Trump doesn't win. That's the scary part to all of this. And from what I understand, the judge even told Trump that uh, he can't attend his own son's high school graduation. If he attends his, high, his son's high school graduation, then the judge said that he's gonna throw Trump in jail. Jeez, man. Jeez, these people, man. The nastiest people in the world, these, these people. 
the nastiest people in the world. They won't even let the man attend his son's graduation. And you know, for Trump, he comes out and he speaks to the media and he says this, the, tr the, the judge is barring me from attending my own son's graduation. And all it does is it makes Trump more popular. It makes Trump stronger. People, people can relate to, to Trump wanting to go see his son graduate high school. People say, yeah, that's a huge event. I couldn't imagine if a judge barred me from seeing my own son's graduation, especially given that this trial is, is just a bunch of nonsense. It makes people relate to Trump even, even more, even better. But, but all of these guys that are going after Trump, they have no reverse gear. No reverse gear. And you can buy reverse gear merch at the reverse gear shop reversegear.shop. You should check it out. The reverse gear merch is, is pretty awesome. Anyway, <laughs> let's do some, uh, some clown worlds and we will wrap this video up. And Macron, Macron is saying that he wants an Olympics truce in Ukraine and Gaza. That is what Macron wants. He, uh, he said that he's gonna do everything possible to have an Olympic truce. No, uh, no fighting in Gaza and no fighting in Ukraine. That is what Macron told French media the other day. And the, and the reports are that when Xi Jinping visits uh, Paris in the next couple of weeks, Macron is going to ask Xi Jinping to speak to Russia and to get a truce in, in the conflict in Ukraine. <laughs> Macron, Macron, who just... Two weeks ago, <laughs> two weeks ago, was talking about sending 20,000 French troops into Ukraine in order to fight Russia, is now going to beg Xi Jinping to talk to Putin in order to, to get an Olympics truce. An Olympics where Russian athletes are not even allowed to compete with their, their flag, representing their country and their country's anthem. They're not even allowed to compete for their country but Macron is expecting Xi Jinping to speak to Putin in order to, to go along with this Olympics truce. This is a Macron who, who just a couple of weeks ago said he's going to send more scalp missiles and more, and more artillery to Ukraine in order to, to fight and defeat Russia. This was just two weeks ago coming from Macron, which just shows you that Macron is just full of it. I've said this many times, Macron is, one day he says this, 24 hours later, he says the exact opposite. The guy is the ultimate, Macron is the ultimate flip flopping puppet president. <laughs> that is Macron, delusional, man. He is just delusional. Why would Russia, why would Russia agree to a truce for an Olympics that they're not even allowed to participate in? <laughs> just, why? Man, Macron really thinks that that uh, that the Russians are just clueless. He really thinks that Russians are clueless. It's unbelievable stuff, man. Unbelievable. And finally, we go to the United States, where John Cougar Mellencamp was giving a concert, and and he was lecturing people at the event about Biden and how cool Biden is. John Cougar Mellencamp, I guess, is a, is a supporter of Biden. Go figure. But uh, he was lecturing the audience on why Biden is best. And the people attending the concert, rightly so, they didn't want to want to get into politics, right? They were there to listen to music and they didn't like the fact that John Cougar, Cougar Mellencamp was talking about politics and lecturing the audience on politics. And, uh, and so John Cougar Mellencamp, <laughs> this, he got so upset with the audience because they didn't want to be lectured on politics that, uh, that he walked away. He ended the concert and walked off stage. <laughs> what a baby, <laughs> John Cougar baby, <laughs> baby camp. <laughs> Oh, man. 
Yeah, he threw a fit. He, he sang like the first verse of Jack and Diane, and then he walked off. <laughs> and he said, concert's over, because the audience came to listen to music and not to listen about, uh, about how cool Biden is and why they should vote for Biden. <laughs> and that triggered John Cougar, John Cougar Mellencamp. When he first started out, he was called, he went by the name John Cougar, and then he added his real last name, Mellencamp. But yeah, <laughs> incredible stuff, huh? So he sang the first verse of, uh, of Jack and Diane, and then he walked off. Little, little ditty that Jack and Diane, good song, great song, actually. A <laughs> great song. But bro, <laughs> don't uh don't get so triggered and and stop your concert and end your concert, bro, <laughs> over Biden, really? Yeah, so he sang the first verse of Little Diddy that Jack and Diane. Little Diddy that Jake and Biden. <laughs> Two American kids growing up in the heartland. Jake. Jake is going to be a White House star. Biden. Biden has the classified docs in his Corvette car. <laughs> oh yeah, life goes on long after the thrill of Alensky is gone. Oh yeah, life goes on long after the thrill of Ukraine is gone, rock gone. <laughs> uh, John Cougar, Mellencamp, feel free to, to take those lyrics and use them for Jack and Diane for your next show. <laughs> That's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop pick up some limited edition merch the link is in the description box down below take care <laughs>